I know um, we just lost someone. They're going to come back on, I think. Um, and, and that's going to happen as we go along. If you have a problem or um, press the wrong button, just come back. <laughs> Terry's manning the, um, the uh, entrances and all. But I wanted to introduce uh, Mary Plouffe. And am I saying that correctly, Mary? Yes. 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 And Mary comes to us. I, I meant to have your book ready and handy. Um, and she's going to be talking about her book, Walking Through Grief with a Child. Thank you. That's exactly what I was going to do. Yep. And yeah. um, this is her story of her working through grief after the loss of her sister and watching her ch her niece um, struggle with this and in, in the process of grief that she went through with it. She does have her private practice and she continues to work with people of all ages, um, work through the grieving process and um, I'm just so happy that she was able to come. We, we had scheduled an in-person meeting at the library. And of course, with COVID, um, all of that had to stop. And these wonderful presentations that people are coming and agreeing to do takes a little bit of practice and it takes a little bit of creativity, but um, we're finding our way through how to do it most effectively. And when I approached Mary, she said um, she'd be willing to, to try and that she really chose would choose to have a Zoom meeting because people could be present in the moment rather than having it just filmed and shown at a different time. And we've done a lot of filming of historical presentations or some authors choose to do it that way, but she really wanted the interaction with everyone. And I couldn't agree more. Um, Zooms, it's not great. You know, we're all sick of it. We're all tired of doing the whole Zoom thing, but I think in, in something as personal as a journey through grief, I think, Mary is exactly right. Um, to have her here talking to us in real time means a lot. So thank you very much, Mary, for agreeing to do this. And and I'm sorry about the phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, I am at work. <laughs> so um, I, I'd like you to take it from here and give us a little bit more of your detailed background and what yeah. you would like to say. But thanks so much for coming to the Berwick Library. Thank you for asking me. Um, I, I came to tell a story because I think we learn from story. And I want to tell you a story about my family, a tragedy that happened to us, and how we pulled together to survive through that. Um, I want to tell you how that story became a book. Um, and this person who is a clinical psychologist and um, not at all a writer, had to become a writer to make that book happen. Um, and then I wanna move on to tell you what I learned from partnering with my brother-in-law and, and, and in caring for my niece. So that's really what I hope to accomplish tonight, tell you a bit about what I learned about childhood grief, how it is different from adult grief, and how adult grief, we'll also end with talking some about adult grief because this book is a weave of my story and my niece's story. So I'm gonna first just tell you who the characters are. Um, my sister Martha was a extroverted, outgoing um, young woman who uh, was at the front lines in the 70s of every uh, labor movement and civil rights movement event that you could imagine. Very unlike her older sister who is lost in her music and her books, Martha was the outgoing, extroverted, red-haired Irish Catholic girl who went to Black Panther meetings at night. Um, she met her husband, Herb, in that process 
and they spent their 20s doing labor union work and lots of other political work. In their early 30s, they decided they wanted to settle down and raise a family. That process of having a child took nine years. It was a terribly difficult process for her. And at 43, she gave birth to their only child, whose name is Leah Marie. My family, on the other hand, is my husband, Bill, and our three children, who at the same time Leah Marie was three, my children were 20, Justin was in college, away at school, Matthew was 15 and in high school, and Margaret was 10. So these, these, are, these are the people that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. And we added one more in a bit, but let me show you who they are. Martha was 45, Leah Marie was two, when she was diagnosed with a very aggressive kind of breast cancer. Um, it was a nasty tumor, and the prescription for treatment was equally nasty. She had to have a mastectomy, two different rounds of chemotherapy, one the usual round, and the, the second round of much higher dose chemotherapy, followed by radiation. She completed that and was, by all measures, cancer-free. However, at the end of that long course of treatment, from January to August, they said to her, your chances of this tumor coming back have dropped from 80% to 50% in the next five years. That was how bad this particular kind of cancer was. So they recommended that she become part of a phase two clinical trial. There were only five uh, medical centers in the country doing these clinical trials at the time at Johns Hopkins. She had to be cancer-free, which she was. She had to be young and healthy and have no other evidence of illness. She signed up after doing her own research and saying to me, I need five years to raise my daughter. I need, excuse me, I need 20 years to raise my daughter, not five. It never surprised me that she would take the risk of going into this phase two trial. Um, that's what she'd done her whole life, was be on the front lines of things. So in the midst of her chemotherapy a couple of months before, her husband's office had transferred him to Las Vegas because their insurance um, because they couldn't risk changing insurers and having him get a new job, he went to Las Vegas and she became the single parent of a two-year-old in the midst of chemo and radiation. So when in August they said to her, excuse me, do you, will you do this, this trial? She called me and she said, will you take Lee Marie? And I said, of course, absolutely. We thought then that it would be three weeks. <clears throat> three weeks ballpark of a bone marrow transplant in the hospital, followed by what was called then phase two, second, phase, second uh, treatment, which was graft versus host disease induced. So three, maybe four weeks. Liam Marie came to us in November. Unfortunately, for a bunch of reasons which really aren't important to the story, the start date was postponed. So three weeks became four months, and it was not until January that Martha was able to start um, the treatment. She sailed through that treatment too, did the bone marrow transplant, with great success, made some changes in the treatment modality with the nurses um, who all sort of fell in love with her spirit and her energy and was discharged on February 7th. Lee Marie had been with me since early November. You'll see in the book that she, um, there's, I talk a lot about her attachment to us and how she bonded with my my children who are still at home and how she came to be a part of our family. 
what it's like. She was exactly three and a half when she came. What it's like for a three and a half year old to be uprooted. Um, my job as a clinical psychologist, I'd had about 20 years then. I'd worked with children and families. And so I felt pretty confident that I could do this. I can take care of this girl for a month. I can help her not um, be traumatized by this. Did not expect that to be four months and certainly did not expect what ultimately happened. Um, Martha was discharged on February 7th to go home to do this, the, the second part of the treatment from home um, as an outpatient for a week. And we had our plane reservations to go home. She lasted 24 hours and her lungs began to fill with a strange substance. She had a 104 fever and was rushed back to the hospital uh, the following day. She was in the hospital about 12 hours when her lungs collapsed and she went into what is called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. She was instantly put on life support. She was on that life support for a month. She never regained consciousness, never spoke to us again. We had no, um, and she died on March 7th. So our story is about how this little girl who was my fourth child of my heart um, was with us when this happened. We had to help her get through that change of suddenly feeling like her mother was going to be home any minute to suddenly mommy has a tube in her throat and we can't talk to her. Um, and after her death, um, I had to help, help her understand what had happened and what had gone awry. Um, her husband, Herb, I think I mentioned before, was a um, high-strung Latino New Yorker as different from me in personality as he could possibly be, um, but as committed to his daughter as he could possibly be. He had also been away from her for a long time and was terrified. And so we bonded. We made a deal that we would do this together. And so for the next six years, we partnered. Every weekend, thank God for the $39 flights from Manchester, New Hampshire, um, he either flew up here or I flew down there um, and we were on the phone every single night um, and slowly, gradually that became every other weekend or every third weekend. But I was substitute mothering and partnering with him from afar. Um, that is the story that the book tells. I want to step aside for one minute. And I, first, I want to add one more person. About six months or so after Martha's death, we added another um, person to our story, and that was a 21-year-old Polish young woman who came as an au pair um, and lived with Herb and Leah Marie. She and I partnered as well. She was learning English, learning Leah Marie, <laughs> and learning how to try to step into um, her mother's shoes, but only as an au pair, not as a substitute mother. Um, she became a part of our family and honestly still is. She's a wonderful young woman. Um, I wanna step aside and tell you about the writing for a minute, because there's a writing story too. I was not a writer. I was a clinical psychologist and I was a teacher. I, I was, uh, in addition to my private practice, I was on the faculty and teaching two days a week at the psychiatry residency program at Maine Medical Center. So I was full time and really pretty busy, but I had never written. I was not a journal uh, kind of person. And uh, as I said before, a deeply private person and an introvert. So I started to write to survive. I wrote at three in the morning when I couldn't sleep. Um, I wrote to try to make sense out of how this had all gone so wrong um, and the decisions we'd made and how cavalierly we had, how sure we had been that because this process had a 98% survival rate, we 
it couldn't possibly go wrong. Um, then I wrote for Herb as we collaborated because he was desperate to understand what I was doing with Leah Marie. And from the beginning when she came to my house and certainly when her mother went uh, into um, ARDS, I began to sit on the floor and use my play therapy knowledge to help her understand what was going on. And I would write about the scenes we played out to help her understand death and forever and cause and effect and all the things, all the constructs that are not there for a child. Um, I, we knew about two weeks in to the four weeks that she was on life support that the hospital did not expect her to survive. That was a very hard piece of knowledge for us to swallow, as you can well imagine. But I said to him, we need to start to talk to a three and a half year old about maybe, maybe mommy will not come home. So all of those things were done in very concrete, literal, visceral ways on the floor playing out the story of Bambi and the story of Snow White, Snow White and people who go to sleep and are awoken by a kiss and how is that different and what is the difference between fantasy and reality. And so as I was doing that, Herb said, write it all down. I need to understand. I need to know how to do this, how to work with this. So I started writing her story, um, which I would send to him. In 2004, um, Herb remarried. Leah Marie was then 10 years old. We had done this from the time she was three and a half until 10. And he said to me, would you mind if I shared the story with Linda, her adoptive mother-to-be? Linda came from a big family of women. Her mother was a teacher and she had four sisters. And they all started to read what I had written about Leah Marie to try to understand what she'd been through and to integrate her into their family. That was the first time when they said to me, this is incredibly useful, um, that, it, that I thought about the possibility of a book. Um, but I, I, I just thought about it. And I thought um, maybe I could write a book as a psychologist telling her story, what it's like for a very young child to grow into her grief and to understand it from the ages of three on to, at that point, 10 or 11. I took that idea to Boston in 2006 and said, I wanna write Leah Marie's story, which is what I was calling it then. And they said, no, uh, you can't do that. You can't be, the objective psychologist in the background. If this was your sister and this was your grief, you need to tell your story and you need to explain um, how child and adult grief differ by weaving them together. Um, that was a pretty horrible thought for me as for personally, and I put the idea away for three years, <laughs> but I'd fallen in love with writing. And so I started taking courses and classes and Maine is a wonderful place to do that. Um, and every once in a while, someone would say, why are you doing this? Why are you writing essays and op-eds? And I'd say, well, there's this story I wanna write. And finally, someone in the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance convinced me to put together another 50 pages, not the 50 I'd taken to Boston, but 50 that wove my story and Leah Marie's together. Um, and that's when this book was born. An author, Suzanne strempick Shea, who taught at Stone Coast, um, was my first mentor. She saw those 50 pages and did everything she could to help me. Susan, Susan Conley, another main author, um, picked up where Suzanne left off. And from 2009 to 2013, there were five, six, seven drafts of this book. And then it was finally finished. Um, but I waited because I wanted Leah Marie to be old enough to give me her permission to be able to understand what I was asking. Um, and that happened when she was 15. 
And I spoke to her and I said, I want to write the story of what happened. And she said, what would I have to do? I said, you don't have to do anything. She said, I don't know what I remember. And I knew that that was true. She had very few, if any, real memories. She had overwritten memories of all the things we had told her. Um, but she said very quietly for a minute, said, you don't have to, I have all the memories you need. I just need your permission because it's really your story I want to tell. And she said, you know what people say to me? They say, you were lucky that your mother, you were so young when your mother died and you don't remember her, so it didn't affect you. And she said, that makes me so angry. <laughs> I may not remember, but it affected me a lot. And if it will help other kids, you should write this book. So from that moment, I was pretty determined <laughs> that we were gonna get this out there. And it was published by She Writes Press in 2017. So that's the, the writing story. Um, I wanna move on here to say, what did I learn from Leah Marie? What are those lessons that are so important about childhood grief? And I think, the first and the most important one is that understanding is gradual. Children do not know what we tell them. They know what they understand. And at three and a half, that was a process that took years. Um, we sat on the floor answering the question, can mama come back? If she dies, can she wake up tomorrow? Will she come back when I need her? Months later, in, when they were home, she would plead with her dad, take me to the train. Why can't we go to the train station? Mommy always got off the train. Please, Daddy, won't you try? She might get off the train again. Object constancy, object permanence, so many things were abstract constructs that were not there for her and that no amount of explanation was going to change. So I learned very quickly, and it's certainly become a mantra for me to say, children grow into their grief. They do not have the same pattern. They grow into understanding it. It is recurrent, and with each developmental step, what they understand is bigger, it's more, and it creates new feelings for them. Um, regression is the body's first response. The first thing that happens to um, a, a child who has had a, a primary parental loss is that they, their body wants to return to the safety of infancy, sleeping, eating, um, any of the, uh, she lost, she went down to 28 pounds at four and a half uh, in the summer after her mother died. Um, she could not keep down much food. Um, and I think we understand that memory and attachment is in the muscles and bones of a four-year-old and a three-year-old. It is not that they don't remember mother, it's that they don't have language to talk about it and they remember it viscerally and they express it viscerally. Um, so that's lesson number two. Um, Safety and security. Children are in what the language of developmental psychology, primary, they have what we call primary narcissism. In other words, it's all about me. It is, it is how is this gonna impact me? And did I cause this happening? How will I be safe? And so those years, three, four, five, six, as the play expanded, she wanted to know, um, how we were going to remake her family. She tried desperately to get me to move, to, to divorce and remarry her father and, and in very simple ways remake family. But she would also, when that fantasy was gone, play out on the floor all of the stories of who was in her family and what if each of us died? And the list would get longer and longer. And the real question is, who would take care of me? 
So that was her, that is, and that is true in so many childhood grief. People talk about them not getting the big picture, said I, they get the big picture, their big picture is survival. And so the answer is, how is this going to, uh, to impact me? Memory is very different for children. Um, memory is, is not yet organized as visual memory and language-based memory. And so it is not a useful aid to grieving. She did not want to hear stories of her mother taking care of her. The one thing she wanted was to hear stories of her mother as a toddler and as a three-year-old and a four-year-old and a five-year-old. She was holding on to the memory of her mother by identifying with her. And this is not atypical. Families that try sometimes to hold too too much to a younger version of the child relating to their parent in a parent-child dynamic, find that those memories are not soothing or helpful for the child for two reasons. One is because um, they are not the same person. They are growing and they are changing. And secondly, their own memories, depending on how far back things are may be very, very uh, limited and not held with language or with pictures that are soothing. Um, time from the loss is less important than events. What mattered to her were times when she wanted a mother and mothering or someone who looked and sounded like a mother. Um, Mother's Day, her birthday, those were crucial times, even though her dad and Mirka could easily have done the tasks. There was a sense of mothering relationship, a person that I have lost, a relationship that I have lost, though she couldn't have put words to it, um, that mattered for her. So we gave her some choices about that. Um, and I think the final comment I would make about this is that the loss exists in each of us at the moment you experience it. And it lives almost like a little camera picture at that time. I always ask, how old were you? What do you visually remember from that? Because that's an important visceral memory. However, with each developmental stage, as, as she moved into, away from, from toddlerhood and into childhood, it was, she was moving into creating a self, creating an identity. And for her, that identity was as a motherless child. Um, so each level there was new understanding, which generated new feelings and sometimes new behaviors. Um, one little 10 year old girl said to me once, it doesn't get worse, it gets different. <laughs> And I think that is absolutely true. It, the grief is recurrent, because, but, un, but we understand it, they understand it anew because of where they are uh, and how, how much they're changing and their understanding of the world is growing. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the differences as we've talked about what I learned from Leah Marie and, and some characteristics of childhood grief, how does it make child grief different from adulthood? Um, first of all, the shape of the grief over time is, is really different. Um, time is your friend when you are an adult who is grieving. Um, I think about it as um, the, as a sideways triangle. The moment of loss of a spouse or another adult um, to an adult is the worst moment that you experience. Doesn't mean you won't have others that feel equally bad, but at that moment, you know what forever means. You know who you are, who that person was, and who you lost. And so that moment is the acute moment of grief is the biggest in some ways, the most powerful moment. And time is your friend as a, an adult 
because you can reach out to others, you can use your memories, you can create patterns of behavior that soothe you over time. And so we move from, as adults, we move from acute, devastating, overwhelming loss through a pattern of resolution. It's not a nice, neat line, but it is, it has a direction because our understanding is complete from the beginning and our sense of self is complete. The other important thing is that because we're adults, we can anticipate, we can do what I call pre-grief. If I lose a spouse at 40, I can imagine what I will have lost at 50. I can imagine both of us being there what we would have wanted to do, what we planned to do. I can begin to incorporate and pre-grieve all of what is ahead of me. Children cannot do that. No five-year-old can imagine what it is like to be 15. They cannot put themselves in an older, more mature version of themselves. Being a grown-up is a magical state. When I grow up, I want to be a fireman but what you will care about, what you will think, and what you will feel is not available to them at young, at, at young ages. And so their grief is recurrent and anew as they grow into themselves. And it matters suddenly that your dad is not here when you're trying to make the soccer team at 15 because you really care as an athlete. You can't envision, you can't know that at five. So there is this cycle of, of recurrent evolution, evolutionary grief that happens for kids that we need to be watchful for and to normalize. I off, always ask kids, what do you remember? But I also ask them, what do you miss the most now? And it's not about the past. It's what do you wish you had now? How is that grief manifesting for you now? Um, and so that, that recurrent, um, recurrent grief through the childhood, the evolution of grief is something we need not. Very often people will say, oh, he's grieving. He's having a really hard time. I guess we didn't do the therapy right three years ago. And my answer is always the same. You can't you cannot do three years ago what he needs to do right now. We just need to say, oh yes, of course, you are missing having a dad again. You are noticing that absence and it means something new for you. Um, the awareness is, is uh, for, all, for adults is constant. We have um, an integrated um, brain uh, emotionally. And so our, uh, we literally, feel and anybody who's had a, a episode of acute grief will tell you I, can't, I couldn't get away from it for a while. I couldn't not be in this devastating moment of sadness. For children, the sadness is still very episodic. The younger they are, the more their expression of grief comes over them like a wave. They can, they live in the moment, they can, they can be distant from and ignore uh, their grief and be happy and play and and then suddenly it will come as an overwhelming uh, experience of loss. There's several times in the book where you will see us doing her four-year-old birthday party and it's she's as happy as she can possibly be until we tell her she has to go downstairs where she and her mother slept to go to bed and she it just is just she compensates. And that is a classic example of how that awareness of grief is not constant. We don't temper it. We don't modulate it um, when we're children, partly because we do not have the capacity um, because we have an immature limbic system. There are brain reasons for that uh, as well. They can't do it even if they want to. But, but what you experience is that children live in the moment and you have to be able to be very flexible to move with them. Um, the expression of grief for adults is much more emotional and verbal. We have language and we have, uh, that language includes understanding of constructs like guilt, fear, panic, 
um, all of those those are those are helpful uh, constructs to manage our grief. Uh, children do not have that language, and even at eight or ten or twelve, they're still developing constructs um, to and language to explain very complex emotions that we need for the deepest and biggest losses of our lives. So what you see is much more physical and behavioral expression of grief. And that includes all the way up to adolescence, that you will see more anger, you will see more acting out, you will see more kids either withdrawing and being afraid to move out into the world or rushing headlong into the world and not wanting to talk about anything uh, except their immediate life. I tried to use in the book my own two children who are home, Margaret and um, Matt, who were 10 and 15, as examples of how the, the, the positive coping strategy was different uh, for them and very typical for their ages. Um, but you, expect, you have to really look through a developmental lens and say, okay, this child is X years old. What are they tackling in their own growth and development? And how is the grief manifesting itself, either as a, in a coping strategy or in a defensive strategy that is not healthy or in something pathological? So you have to be sort of on the, uh, on the lookout for those things. Um, the resolution of grief, how do we resolve as adults um, our grief? How do we move toward something called adaptive grief, integrated grief. One is, one of the primary ways is by integrating memories. We spend a lot of time talking about the person who we lost. We soothe ourselves with the gratitude that we have for the time we had together. We try to find meaning in the loss. Um, by defining their presence in our lives in more positive ways. Certainly, this book is the way that I, one of the ways that I did that. So that when I think of my sister, I no longer think of the last month of her life, the horror of that room. I think about the fact that she came into this world to give me a chance to do something with her life and with her tragedy. And that gives me comfort. It helps me to resolve my sadness. Doesn't mean I don't have moments of sadness, but we use our memories and our meaning, making of meaning to do that. For children, they are experiencing, um, I often say to people, for children, um, loss is not about memory, it's about absence. It's about what is missing in my life, what is not there for me. And what does that mean? And it's not only what does it mean in terms of why did it happen, but it, it is why did it happen to me? And what does it mean about me? If I did not have that, does that mean I am deficient in some way? Does it mean I was defective to start with? It weaves that absence weaves into their sense of self. And I'll talk more about that later because that's what I'm writing about um, further on. Um, but memory and absence are very different. We often want children to be soothed by memories and they are not. Um, they are soothed by creating memories or learning new things sometimes about a parent that they have never known. Um, or by tackling with someone who understands what does the whole feel like? What, do you, what does the absence feel like? Um, so finally, this developmental understanding um, infant, for infants and, survive, and, and toddlers, uh, loss is about that bonding and how do I get it back? Um, how do I feel safe and secure um, for Young, young children moving out in the world in early childhood, it's about self-identity. How will others think of me? I had a little girl say to me the other day, um, I don't know whether kids like me or just feel sorry for me, and I'll never be able to tell. <laughs> um, 
And that is because her sense of I have the one thing they're all terrified about, and that is I have lost my mother, um, is, is woven into her self-identity at, um, she was a middle schooler at a time when self-identity is such a critical um, issue. For older adolescents, you often see difficulties with adolescents, with, uh, excuse me, with uh, emancipation and with intimacy. These are kids whose task is to leave home, to separate from parents, and to bond and create intimacy with potential boyfriends, girlfriends, deep friendships, love partners. Parenting, especially mothering, as I describe it in the book, um, is one of the, is the earliest experience of bonding. We bond from being created inside the, the womb and then being held and nurtured and nursed and cuddled. Um, and that is our earliest experience of intimacy. And when that is disrupted, you often have children wondering, um, will I be able to be close to someone? Will I be able to trust? Will I be able to nurture my own children? Um, those are not unanswerable questions, but they are normal questions. And rather than be frightened of them, um, I think it's really important to expect them. Um, mm -hmm. Let me look here and see. Um, all right, let's move. How are we doing on time here? I'm, I'm going to move to the last section of this before I talk about what I'm writing next, and then maybe we can have um, uh, a question, question and answer period because they asked me not to do that as we went along because they want to be able to leave that um, out of the recording of, uh, to be viewed by others so that, that we have some privacy about that. But I do want to talk a little bit and I'm going to shift gears here to talk about what we call adaptive adult grief. Um, and when my sister died, the most popular book about adult grief was the Kubler-Ross books about death and dying. And um, they were very stage oriented. You had stages of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. There's one problem with that. One is that poor Elizabeth Kubler-Ross never intended those books to be used to explain how you grieve another person. Her research was done on people who had been told that they were going to die. And those stages worked very nicely, although she never intended them to be sequential either. And she, you have to write a book in some sort of order. And as she said, sometimes they mix themselves uh, up. But they were all phases rather than stages that someone who had been told that their life was coming to an end would go through. Um, we have learned since then that our adaptation of that to how adults grieve a, parent, a loss of a parent, a loss of a child, a loss of a spouse, those stages don't work at all. Um, that in fact, um, there is no stage um, formulation that makes, uh, that that everyone goes through. There is the initial acute profound grief, which is overwhelming, dominating emotion of loss, um, intrusive thoughts, uh, inability, all the, dis all, all what the dysregulation that I talked about a minute ago with the early children. We can all experience that right after in the early stages of a loss, uh, particularly if that loss is sudden and unexpected. Um, those losses that are attenuated, I won't have time to talk about that with children or adults today, but there is pre-grieving that happens with that too. And so sometimes the acute stage of loss is not as difficult. Um, there is what I call adaptive loss, where you begin to regulate affect, um, reduce those intrusive thoughts, integrate memories, and create a narrative about how this happened, why it happened, that you can live with. 
There are so many ways we do that when we have to let go of someone we have loved deeply, whether it's by saying their suffering wasn't as long as it might have been, or the life that they had gave them um, gave them things that you would have you wanted them to have and that were valuable. Um, gradually, in that adaptive phase, we begin to be able to open to the idea of future joy or a present joy in the moment. Um, so when we talk about adaptive adult grief, I'm still talking about someone who's really grieving, and that can be a, the first several years after a major loss. Um, but there, there is light and darkness, uh, whereas in the acute stage, there's very little light. Um, integrated grief is the stage you're aiming for. It's a more lasting form where the grief is not so dominant. Um, and now we have come up with a phrase um, called complicated grief. And I would refer any of you who are interested to the uh, two organizations, one for adult grief, the Columbia Center for Complicated Grief is the most, um, uh, the, the best place to go to understand what, how to define complicated grief and how to treat it. I've taken a number of courses from them and they describe complicated grief as when that process from acute grief to adaptive to integrated grief gets stuck and um, maladaptive thoughts are repeated over and over and we are obsessed and unable to move through the process. They are training people now to help adults who have complicated grief to work through that process. Um, the other place I'll just say a little bit about is the National Association for Grieving Children. It is um, www.childrengrieve.org. And that is the center, center for um, all of the information on programs for children's grief throughout um, the country. Um, when my sister died, I called the Center for Grieving Children. It was one of three in the country. There are now over 300 um, programs for uh, childhood grief uh, in this country and, and many more growing. Last thing, I'll just flip this up just for a little promo here. What am I doing now? I am writing a theoretical formulation that uh, talks about the evolution, a theory of the evolution of childhood grief as a recurrent uh, loss of mother the person, mothering the function in the relationship, and motherlessness, which is the self-definition that I talked about a minute ago. My hope is that I can produce this for uh, professionals who work with children so that it is a, a structure, a skeleton, a theoretical formulation that they can apply to any unique situation, modify uh, to provide treatment modalities for kids all the way through to adulthood who have lost a parent. So that's all I have to say today. <laughs> and I would love to, um, your comments or questions or um, thoughts from anybody. Mm -hmm.